my heart reaches out to all of our fellow Jamaicans. Jamaica today is certainly a country at a crossroads, wrestling with the cancer of drugs and crime. Cancer is a good analogy. Caught early, it's curable. Wait too long, tolerate it for too long, it overwhelms you. It is tempting for other West Indian islands to say, that's Jamaica, that couldn't happen here. And I think the dangers are all in the direction of complacency. It's true to say that choices are made, things don't happen entirely by accident. We can learn many things from Jamaica. We can learn many good things from Jamaica and we can learn some things that we must try and avoid. We can learn that there is no excuse in crime because it happens to others. There is no tolerating of injustice because it happens to others. There is no complacency that it doesn't matter the government's inefficient because I know someone who can get me that license, get me that form. I don't need to stand up in the queues. It is that kind of complacency that leads to trouble. And one of the things we can learn too is that growth is not a luxury, it is a necessity. Decades, decades now, of effectively zero growth in Jamaica has gone a long way to contributing to the ills and woes and difficulties and challenges and deep challenges that Jamaica now faces. Growth for the region is not a luxury, it is a necessity. And there are increasing challenges, narrowing options for the region. Crime undermines tourism. How can the region of the world with the highest crime rate in the world also depend upon its living through tourism. That is not sustainable. We were told for decades that the way to diversify our economies from sugar, from bananas, was tourism and financial services. We were given support to make that change. And now even in financial services, there is tremendous pressure on the region's financial centres. They cannot stay as they are, they must evolve in a different way. To grow in today's world, one has to be globally competitive. There is, I'm afraid, no other way to do it. There is no other way to grow without being globally competitive. Now many people think that in the Caribbean we cannot be globally competitive. And my talk to you today is not a talk of pessimism. It is in fact a talk of optimism. Caribbean people around the world have reached the highest echelons. Be it our Nobel laureates in writing, our musicians. You cannot spend a day listening to the radio ads in Britain without hearing at almost every other ad a West Indian piece of music, a refrain of reggae, or calypso, soca, writing. Caribbean people have excelled the world over. The creative industries. And you know, what is entrepreneurism but creativity? If our creative industries can be world class, our entrepreneurs can be world class. To be globally competitive, to be world class in the world, in the future of small states, I think that has a lot to do with, and you've heard, some of you have heard me say this before, being exporters of skills, exporters of professional expertise. Yes, we can't outcompete the Chinese in manufacturing. We can't outcompete the Indians at outsourcing and call centers. 
But we can outcompete in terms of being a wonderful place to live, in terms of a physical and social environment that is world class. We can try, and I believe we can succeed, in being a place that can export professional services, professional services that are world class. To do that rests on three pillars. We have to make our education world class. Our education used to be world class. People used to come back to educate their kids. We can do that. We've done it before. We need to have government that is not a disabling government. And many of you in business will know what I mean by disabling government. We need to have governments that are enabling governments, that facilitate. In small countries, competition is about business, but it's also about facilitating that business. So we need to work hard on our education, on our environment, on our government and public sector reform. But these are all things we can do. These are things achievable. I don't want to have a long conversation with you today. I want to uh, say these few remarks and hopefully we can enter into a wider discussion as the evening progresses. But let me end by saying this. We have no alternative but to be globally competitive. But we can do it. We can achieve it. The opportunities are there for us to grasp. But they will not stand idly by. We don't grasp them now. They will drift away into our past and not be part of our future. A key part of what I'm saying to you today, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Caribbean must take responsibility. We must indigenize change. Change starts with us, not without. And that is a key emblem, a key task, a key objective that Capri sets out for itself. And as we open the new Barbados office, I want to end by thanking those who have made this possible. I think a key aspect, a critical aspect of Capri, Something that allows it to think independently is by being financially independent. One of the things I've learned in my life, it's very hard to think independently when one is financially dependent. And so Capri is not dependent on governments. We would like Capri to be funded by those who it benefits, the people, the business people of the Caribbean and the ordinary people, the civil society of the Caribbean. And we've also received, over the years, significant support from those also interested in change and reform for the better in the Caribbean. And I must thank especially CEDA for all the work it's done for Capri in Jamaica and I'm Hope, uh, Hope Capri in Barbados. I must also thank DFID. I think I saw Harry uh, earlier uh, to thank too for the support they have given and all those others who've given support to Capri and all those others in the future who will join with me in supporting this endeavour of indigenizing, localizing the arguments for change and the reality of change. Thank you very much.